and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. I'm Scott Miller, and each week I serve as your host and interviewer. And this is, we're coming upon one year that On Leadership has been in existence. It is now the fastest growing, largest newsletter dedicated to leadership. And our format every week is I have the honor and the humbling privilege to interview typically a remarkable thought leader, best-selling author, CEO, or some person who's just tackled a topic and brought great wisdom for all of us in our leadership roles. Today is a really sort of humbling day because we have the intellectual giant and the emotional giant, Susan David, joining us from Boston, where she serves as a psychologist for the Harvard Medical School and is a renowned expert on emotions, the role they play in our lives, and the author of the number one best-selling book, Emotional Agility. Susan, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you. I'm delighted to be connecting with you. Well, Susan, I kind of fell in love with you professionally about six months ago. I had the privilege of joining uh, several thousand leadership you know, followers around the world at the World Business Forum in New York City. It's an annual event and they invite the very most influential people from around the world. Presidents, prime ministers, CEOs, and people of your stature that have really dug deep into a topic that affects our lives. And beyond your South African accent, I was captivated with your expertise and your own journey around understanding the importance of being nimble and agile with our emotions. Before I get into the book, I'd like you to spend just a minute and kind of tell us who you are, what your journey has been, and how did you come to land at Harvard Medical School and to author this book? Absolutely, so thank you. It's wonderful connecting. Yeah, so I grew up in South Africa. I grew up in the white suburbs of apartheid South Africa. And really it was a community and country at the time that was committed to not seeing, to not seeing the other, to not seeing emotions, to denial. And I, at a very early age, became interested in how people ultimately navigate emotions and stories and thoughts and inner psychology in what is in an imperfect world. Uh, when I was around 15 years old, my father was diagnosed with terminal cancer. And one of the things that really was pivotal to me was the experience of so many people telling me to be positive. You know, just get on with it, be positive, you're coping so well, whereas inside I was just dying. And so I, I really started this journey where I began to ask a very simple question, but a very complex one, as they all are, which is what does it take internally in the way we deal with our thoughts? It might be a thought like I'm not good enough or this organization is ridiculous with all this change. It might be an emotion, emotions of sadness or anger, frustration, boredom, or even it might be a story that we tell ourselves about who we are in the world, what we're capable of, what we're good at, what we're not good at. Some of these stories were written on mental chalkboards in grade three. And I became really interested in the way we deal with our thoughts and our emotions and our stories in ways that ultimately help us to be productive and thriving and healthy individuals. And this, of course, interfaces in a really profound way with organizations because organizations are made up of, as we know, individuals. And every single person comes to work with feelings about the organization or about their work or about their colleagues. And so much of the work that we do within organizations is about how to develop out effective strategy, but we do very little work in a democratized way that really touches the hearts and minds of the individual to help people to bring the best of themselves forward. Because what I find really interesting when I go to forums like Wobi or in any context in which I'm working with organizations is that people will often say, well, you know, this is our DNA strategy or this is our engagement strategy and they're wonderful and they're beautiful and they're sacred and important. But ultimately, no individual goes to work saying, today I don't want to be inclusive mm. or today I don't want to be a caring leader. All of us have great intentions. What happens is we go to the organization, we go to work and we feel stressed. We feel like we don't have the information that we need. We've got a colleague that's undermining us. 
And so what happens on a micro behavior day to day experience is we will often bring forward the worst of ourselves or parts of ourselves that we least proud of. And so my work concerns this question, you know, what does it take internally in the way we deal with our thoughts, our emotions and our stories that help us to thrive in a world that is fragile and imperfect? So Susan, thank you for that opening. It's helpful to get a sense for your passion around this uh, professional skill, life skill that we all yep. struggle with. You can see from the set, I read a lot of books. I'm privileged to interview a lot of authors. And there are some books that I can read in two or three hours and some I might spend you know, two nights on. And then there are those books that take me a month to get through because I read two pages, I have to put it down and really think about you know, what does this mean in my life? What does it mean as a leader? How am I identifying with this? And your book is that I've read it one and three quarter times now because it takes me like a month to get through it because it's not poorly written, it's so profound. One of my favorite parts of the book actually is in the opening where you talk about the stories we tell ourselves and the internal chatter, chatterbox. Will you bring some of your research to this conversation around how important is it to understand what we tell ourselves, what's true, what's not true, and how it can impact our lives. You have so many relatable examples of how one thought turns to a next, turns to a next, and you build an argument with your spouse, and then you're ready to fight. And would you just share some thoughts around that? Yeah, so, you know, one of the most uh, important things when we think of how we navigate the world is that all of us as human beings need to decode a huge amount of sensory input every single day. So we have thousands of pieces of data coming at us, noise and light and information and, and so on. And so what we do, and it's a very normal thing that we do as human beings, which is that we pull pieces of these data together in what land up being coherent narratives. Mm -hmm. Now, these coherent narratives hang together in some way in our minds, but they don't always necessarily reflect our values or reflect who we want to be. So we might have a coherent narrative that says, um, I'm not a creative person, or I'm not good at math, or I would love to have this particular career, but actually I'm not going to be successful of it. And sometimes that narrative is born out of some reality in our lives. You know, we might not be fundamentally hugely talented at this particular part of creative thinking. Um, or bringing it together in a product. Um, but often what happens is we draw together these narratives, these stories, and they are normal, they are natural, because what they do is they help us to shortcut, to think of Dan Kahneman's work in uh, system one thinking, where we make these quick intuitive deductions. You know, do I trust this person? Do I not trust that person? Um, should I put my hand up for this opportunity? Should I not? So what we do is we create these narratives. The narratives themselves are normal. We all do it. And it's a way of keeping us sane in a busy world. But what starts to happen is some of our narratives can not serve who we want to be. So I want to put my hand up for this opportunity. But the narrative that started maybe when I was 13 years old that told me who I am, what I deserve, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, holds me back because I've now got this story that I'm living into. And so what we have is we have a story that instead of becoming a part of us, where we're saying to ourselves, is this story, yeah, it's it's a story, it makes sense, but is it actually reflective of who I want to be? Is it reflective of my values? Instead, the story owns us rather than we owning the story. And, you know, one example of... Uh, you know what, again, Dan Kahneman thinks of as, as these intuitive system one thinking, and that I talk about in my book, is, you know, stereotypes, uh, biases, all of these things are narratives that we often draw together, but that hinder our ability to actually thrive effectively. Susan, I felt like I had my own personal psychologist reading the book, because you are, <laughs> but I found such... Um... Uh, validation when you talked in the opening part around uh, you know this chatterbox in your head and how one conversation leads to a next and before you know it you've built a narrative that probably isn't accurate and you start to maybe 
envision conversations that probably would be different if you weren't building almost a self-fulfilling pro fulfilling prophecy. For those people out there like me that are married and have children and we have relationships with yeah. strife in our lives, what advice would you give us around how your, your, your own chatterbox can lead you in a direction that actually can develop ideas and thoughts that aren't helpful for us? And how do we know when we've kind of gone too far in our minds? Well, a very important uh, recognition of this is simply when you are in this mental chatterbox mode. So I'll give you an example of what we mean by the chatterbox is imagine you've had a situation with your spouse or even with a colleague at work where you're a bit frustrated with them. So what we can start doing is we can start having this kind of mental dialogue of if the person says this, then I'm going to say that. And if I come across the individual in a meeting, then I'm going to react to them in this. And so what we start to do is we start to get into this whole he said, she said, uh, this is how I'm going to play the scenario out. And we create this entire line by line dramatic narrative. Now, again, this is very human. We all do it. But what we are often not doing is we're not saying to ourselves, um, how is the situation that I'm building this narrative around, how is the way that I am coming to it either going to serve me or not serving me or not serve me? So we might say something like, if she says this, then I'm going to leave the room. And if they do this, then I'm going to do such and such. And what we fail to ask is, who do I want to be in this situation? You know, who do I want to be? How is it that how I'm coming across reflects my values? If my value is to be a contributor, how can I stay in this environment and keeping a contributor? So you ask for practical solutions or practical ideas around it. I think one of the first is when we recognize that we're in this mental mode of busy mind is to really start saying, who do I want to be here? You know, I'm, I'm noticing that there's this busyness. Who do I want to be? So that's one of the first things. And then the other thing that I think happens with all of us, again, this is a human condition, is we are very likely to treat our feelings and our thoughts as fact. So because I thought it, because I thought that I'm a bad mom and I should be guilty about it, it means I'm a bad mom. Because I thought that my boss is an idiot, my boss is an idiot. Because I thought that I'm not cut out for this particular role, even though I want it, it means I'm not cut out. So what we start doing is we start conflating our feelings and our thoughts as fact. Whereas we have thousands, thousands of unspoken, around 16,000 unspoken thoughts every day, and thousands more that are spoken. And many of these are just our brain trying to do its job, which is protect us, look after us, think of what might go wrong. But our brain isn't always working in our best interest. You know, our brain will lead us off a cliff where we land up having a massive argument with someone, even though it doesn't serve us. And so what's a really important aspect of emotional agility is starting not to ignore your thoughts and emotions, because this is a very important part of my work, which is not about ignoring, but rather notice your thoughts and feelings for what they are. They are thoughts and feelings. They are not facts. And so if we can start saying something like, uh, I'll give you an example that I gave in my TED talk, the gift and power of emotional courage. In my TED talk, I describe how often when we upset, we might say something like, I am sad, I am angry. When you say I am, what it's doing is it's conflating, once again, all of you, 100% of you with that feeling. I am sad. There's no space for anything else. There's no space for wisdom. There's no space for my values. There's no space for breathing or curiosity, or courage, there's no space for anything else. Instead of saying, I am sad, or I am being undermined, if we can start noticing the thought, emotion, or feeling for what it is, I'm noticing that I'm feeling sad. I'm noticing the feeling of being undermined. I'm noticing the urge to leave the room, 
when my spouse starts in on the finances. So you start noticing your thoughts, feelings, and urges for what they are. They're thoughts, feelings, and urges. They're not fact. What we start to do is we start to, in psychological terms, we start to create a kind of meta view of our thoughts and feelings. And we've all had this. You know, we've all had the experience where we're on the phone and we're angry with someone. You know, maybe it's a customer service agent and they've gotten your bill wrong yet again. And we've got this emotion, which is anger, but we're able to recognize that if we let that anger out in an unfettered way, that the person will conveniently lose our file. And so we feel the emotion, but there's this ability to also recognize that just blurbing it out is not going to be helpful. And this is what's called the meta view. And the meta view actually, as it turns out, is fundamentally important to our ability to be healthy individuals, because you are able to say, I'm having this feeling, but I'm not the feeling. I'm able to notice it for what it is. And in doing so, I can start creating space and perspective. There are other very practical strategies that I talk about in my book, but that's one example, one practical strategy. Doctor, can you pencil me in for two hours tomorrow in your office? Because I think <laughs> I might need more of your time. I wish you could see the production crew behind the cameras. They're all like mesmerized and captivated listening to you right now. Because what you just described, I do all the time. I mean, I'm 50, I'm a seasoned leader, I'm a fairly, fairly accomplished person, but I build a narrative in my mind, in my car in the morning or driving home about a colleague, about my spouse, and I'm ready to take it on when I've built this false narrative that's actually not based in fact. They didn't say the eight things I think they're going to say, and I'm guessing that's not unique to just me, I hope. It's, well, this is the thing, it's, it's so, human and it's actually normal it is the way that your brain prepares itself for if i'm attacked what do i do so it's a completely completely normal experience and this is why i also think that a very important part of my book you know i try to write my book from the perspective of it's it's evidence-based but it's also very practical and i bring a lot of myself my my own human experience into it because i think that that um balance helps to capture some of the ideas and one of the things that i talk about is this experience that if you if you have this if you start engaging in this busy mind or this checks and balances all the time did this person do this did they do that what we start doing is we start tensing into an experience of ourselves. we start you know the leaders who are listening will know that experience of um we we start walking through life with a tense set of expectations you know did Johnny deliver today? Have we achieved this goal? And, you know, this set of expectations is really important. Um, but what starts to happen is we start not only to create the set of stories, but we also start to lose our sense of uh, compassion. Compassion not only for the other, that, you know, Johnny, yes, there is an expectation that he deliver, but Johnny might be doing the best that he can with the resources that he has got right now. And it's not to say we don't have expectation, but the idea that we, we sometimes need to soften into ourselves and softening into ourselves allows us to enjoy our experience of life more and enjoy the experience of work more. And what that often takes is it also takes a healthy dose of self-compassion, you know, Yes, you've got the story. The story might not serve you, um, but it doesn't mean we need to punish ourselves for having the story. We can recognize that that story comes from a place of our common humanity where we all do it, or the story might come from a point in your life where in order to protect yourself, that story was actually functional. So I'll give you an example. A senior leader that I was working with a couple of years ago described how, and not everything relates to childhood, but described how in this particular person's childhood, that when he showed a level of vulnerability in his family of origin, that he was actually punished for it. And so what had started to happen in his now adult life as a very senior leader is he was starting to get feedback from the environment, which is, you very standoffish, you seem very arrogant, mm. 
we are struggling to get a sense of connection and a shared sense of vision with you. And so what had happened is this individual had had a very functional story for one time in his life, but that story was now almost constricting him at a later point. And so this is the point of emotional agility, which is that we can never step into the same river twice. The world is changing, we are changing, our life is changing, expectations are changing all the time. And so in order to be healthy, we need to be able to recognize that something that served us at one point might not serve us anymore. And we also need to start to develop or cultivate a very important dose of the ability to be with our thoughts, our emotions and our stories in ways that are effective, that are connected with our values and that allow us to make on the ground changes so that we can adapt to situations as they unfold. Are you taking new patients? <laughs> My team would like to know. <laughs> they have a name they'd like to submit to you. <laughs> I don't. I, so most of my work at the moment is actually focused on um, really working at the people strategy level in organizations where I'm working, you know, separate from my speaking, but where I'm working alongside heads of people uh, and CEOs that are really focused strategically on how to bring these ideas at scale into organizations. And the reason that I'm doing this is because, you know, what's what's really interesting again, when you think of organizations is the openness that an organization has to the normal range of human experience is really fundamental in terms of the ability of the organization to achieve its strategic goals. And if you bear with me, I'll describe what I mean here is every organization says we want to be innovative. But there's an intimate dance between innovation and failure. We want growth, an intimate dance between growth and disappointment. And so what we actually find is it's only when organizations actually open to the normal range of human emotions in which, you know, to use the psychological term that's being used a lot lately, which is psychological safety. When the organization opens itself up to actually this person might disagree or might be frustrated and there's actually value in that information because it can help us to systematize more effectively or it can help us to adjust our product offering more effectively that openness to the full range of emotional experience is actually fundamental to the ability to be agile. An organization cannot simultaneously be agile and yet be closed to the fact that human beings will disagree and be frustrated. And I'm not saying that organizations, you know, one of the things that I talk about in my TED talk and in my book is what I call false positivity. I'm not saying that organizations tell people all the time, you've got to be positive, you've got to be positive. Um, many do. But what a lot of organizations do is they say things like, you know, a leader might say, you either on the bus or you off the bus. You know, we're going through this change, you either on the bus or you're off the bus. What are we doing when we say that? What we are doing is we are partialing out the reality of what people are experiencing. And when we partial out and when we say that's not allowed here, we create a lack of psychological safety. And we also make it difficult for the organization then to innovate because difficult emotions aren't allowed that might come with failure and so on. So we see this in leadership actions where leaders say, you know, we're just not going to go there. But we also see it in um, very often the focus of the organization on just pushing through, just getting on with it. And if we can't uh, recognize, because I think this is actually a critical part of it, that human beings are not machines. And I know this is obvious, but a lot of management thinking is actually born out of the industrial revolution. You know, you uh, put this particular piece in at the beginning and you've got this machinery and something else, a product will come out at the end. 
And I think what happens so often in organizations is we transpose that industrial revolution idea to the human beings that work in the organization. So for instance, this is our strategy. If we just tell people the logic of it, they'll believe it. it just doesn't work. Or even these are our values. We know that if we just tell people what values, even if we are persuasive, even if we're wonderful, even if we're compelling, the way that people truly live values is not by being told what the values are. The way we help people to live values is by helping them to see how what's important to them as individuals can connect with the organization's values. And we can do this in very simple, scalable, effective ways. But these uh, human aspects of who we are actually become fundamental for the organization's ability to achieve what it's trying to. Susan, I want to save some time to talk about the four cores of emotional agility. Before yeah. we go there, would you expand a little bit on this concept of positive and negative emotions and that people tend to favor positive emotions as opposed to negative and why that might not be the smartest thing to do in our lives? Well, this is, this is critical and it actually leads into the four steps of emotional agility, which is that in recent research that I did of over 70,000 people, I found that around a third of us see our emotions, our own emotions, as either good or bad, positive or negative. And then you have that one third that then gets expanded out, out dramatically when you look at how people experience others' emotions. So the emotions of our children, the emotions of our spouse, the emotions of our colleagues, what we tend to do as individuals is we have this narrative that is perpetuated by society, which is that there are good emotions and bad emotions. And usually the good emotions are the positivity, the joy, and the bad emotions are anger, sadness, um, frustration, and so on. And so what we often have is what we call display rules. Display rules are the unspoken rules that exist in organizations and in our families about what emotions are okay and what emotions are not okay. So your child comes home from school and says, you know, mommy, no one would play with me today. And with the best of intentions, we might jump in and say, don't worry, I'll play with you. Because it feels difficult to see that child sad. Now, what does this do? The first thing, and this lesson applies to organizations and to us as individuals, the first thing that it does is it teaches the child that some emotions are scary and big and difficult and to be pushed aside. The second thing that it does is it doesn't actually teach the child to develop skills to label and navigate those emotions. Gee, this is what sadness feels like. I felt sad and now my sadness has passed. What did I do that helped that sadness to pass? When we allow our children to experience their emotions in a way that is the reality of that life is fragile and that they're gonna experience them at some point, and when we don't try to push them aside, what we actually do is we help them to deal with those emotions in a way that cultivates their sense of uh, resilience. And it also helps them to build their character because they can start also saying, I'm sad and we can help them with this conversation. I'm sad that no one would play with me at school. And instead of pushing that aside for the child, if we start having conversations with the child of, it sounds like people playing with you and belonging is really important. That a sense of belonging is a core aspect of your values and what's important. How might you, when you go to school tomorrow, start to connect more with one or two other people? Instead, we often don't do that. Instead, what we do is the child might come home and say, you know, no one will play with me today and I'm upset and I'm now I'm not gonna play with them tomorrow. And what they're doing is there's no space between stimulus and response. So they're not actually in a space where they're inserting their values. Now, I know most listeners are not listening 
because of parenting. Oh no, yes they are. I'm captivated. You just described my last night dinner table. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, depression is the single leading cause of disability globally. And our children are going to be growing up in a world in which they will be dealing with fragility and heartache and job loss. And so it is our job as parents to help them to be able to deal with and have skills to deal with the full range of emotions, not just the ones that feel good. You know, so now we take these principles and we start applying them to our own lives and into organizations. And what we soon realize is that we might say, gee, I'm unhappy in my job, but at least I've got a job. And that emotion feels bad. And so we try to be positive and fake positive about it. But if we just pause, if we just show up to that emotion for a brief period and we say, what is the value that this emotion is pointing to? What we realize is that our emotions, even the most difficult ones, contain signposts to the things that we care about. So my sense of uh, frustration at work might be a signpost that being seen is really important to me and I'm not feeling seen. Or that frustration might be a signpost to me that growth is really important and there's a lack of growth in my job, in my role right now. So when we pause, when we show up to our difficult emotions, recognizing that our emotions are not fact, but they are data. So they are data, not directions. They give us really important information. We don't need to listen to them. Not every time I feel something or think something, do I have to act on it? But if I just pause and show up and say, what is this? emotion trying to tell me about my situation, about my colleague, about my job, about who I want to be right now, then what we are able to do is we are able to start making changes, what I call tiny tweaks, values aligned changes that can actually help us to navigate and to adjust and to be more fulfilled and connected. Hence the term emotional agility, because these are these on the ground skills that help us to be the people, the leaders, the parents that we ultimately want to be. Susan, it is captivating listening to you. Our, our, our time is tight, but I want to spend less than a minute on each of these four aspects of emotional yeah. agility. You write in the book as showing up, stepping out, walking your why and moving on. Would you just take maybe less than a minute on each and frame why those are so important to identify with and be aware of, especially perhaps in leadership roles and organizations? Absolutely. So showing up, and I'll do this as applied to ourselves, but it applies to others as well. <clears throat> showing up is really, so showing up is really about the ability to say, what is it that I am feeling? To move out of the space of saying, I've got to be positive, I've got to be this, I've got to be that, I've got to be, you know, to really show up with curiosity and compassion to what it is that you're experiencing and to try to do the same to others. Stepping out is recognizing that in those difficult emotions, those emotions contain data to our values, signposts to our values, but they are not directives. So stepping out is not about pushing emotions aside, but rather recognizing that as human beings, emotions have a place, but they aren't the boss. And there are strategies that are very helpful to do this. The example that I gave earlier, instead of I am sad, I am noticing that I'm feeling sad. That is a stepping out technique. The next is about walking your why. Starting to connect more with the heartbeat of who we want to be in this situation. Because values often have this idea of being cheesy, they things on walls in businesses, and they don't really apply to us. But of course, values are qualities of action. Every single day, we have hundreds of choice points. Do I take the muffin 
which is a choice point that might be away from my values, or do I take the fruit? That might be a choice point that's towards my values. So every day we have hundreds of choice points that are basically how can I, in a practical, active way, move towards my values or away? Do I contribute to the meeting or do I shut down because I'm upset now? So that's walking your why. The last is what I call tiny tweaks. And tiny tweaks is the idea that often what we do is we get into habits that are disconnected with our values. We might come home from work and we value our time with our children, but we take our cell phone to the table. And so we've got this very precious opportunity that we squander. Or we might value our loved one, but we keep on our emails when our loved one comes home from work. So the idea that I really talk about is that often what we can do at work and at home and in our parenting is there are small shifts that we can make that are fundamentally using the physics of habit change to create more values connected behaviors and that impact on every aspect of how we love, how we live, how we parent and how we lead. Susan, I think you may have just single-handedly single stimulated the global economy by having people find or call their therapist. It's been a delight, <laughs> delight listening to you as a leader, as a friend, as a child, as a husband, as a father of three young boys. I found your book to be captivating. I mentioned I've read it almost twice now. I'm going to refer it to everyone I know. Uh, I discovered you, I mentioned, by listening to you keynote at the World Business Forum. We call it Will Be for short. Talk a bit about how organizations engage with you, your availability to keynote, kind of what is your sweet spot? If someone's looking to learn more about becoming emotional, emotionally agile and leaders, how can they engage with you? So firstly, there are a couple of uh, just resources that might be of help to people. The first is the book, Emotional Agility. The second is my TED talk. It's called The Gift and Power of Emotional Courage. And the third is that I've got a free quiz on my website which has a 10 page report that a lot of people, uh, around 120,000 people have taken it, might find helpful. And that's at susandavid.com forward slash learn. The things that I'm mostly focusing on is uh, really working with organizations as it relates to scaling these ideas in organizations. And what I mean here is that organizations, I think are becoming increasingly frustrated with trying to change culture change engagement, and we really often try to do this top down. But ultimately, uh, culture is made up of the micro habits every single day of individuals. No person comes to work and says, I don't want to be inclusive, but I'm in a habit or I'm in a story that stops me from being inclusive or collaborative or innovative or relational or customer centric or whatever it is we want to include there. And so a lot of what I'm focusing on at the moment is starting to, in the very early stages, develop our scalable services software tools that help us to think about culture change as a function of the, the nexus of these micro behaviors and how they expand into real culture change. Susan, thank you for your time. I'll see you tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock <laughs> for, two, for two hours. I hope to have you back sometime because there is a whole part of this book we've not discussed, and I think it is a great handbook for leaders at every level. It's a great, it's a great book on how to be a good friend, how to be, a good, how to be more self-aware as a spouse with your partner and your children. It's a great gift. Thank you so much for joining us today on Leadership. I encourage everyone listening to buy Emotional Agility for yourself and your partner if you're in a relationship. Read it. And you give us a lot of permission to kind of understand. I like that it didn't shame me. It gave me a lot of validation that here's why I'm going through this, and now how can I own it, assess it, and kind of move through that. Susan, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. You've been really gracious. Great conversation. Thank you, everybody. You got to listen to this one. Put this in your social media. Send it out to everybody in your organization. What a gift we have today from Susan David. Pick up a copy of Emotional Agility, and we'll see you back here next week on Leadership.